6, spirit life under item 5, again item 5, choice of earthly trials. Okay? Let's talk about that. So, when we're talking about choices, we cannot talk about choices if we don't talk about free will. Because that's what choices are, right? We, we don't make a choice if we're not enabled to make a choice. And in everything that we do, we have the power. This is, the, this is what makes us like gods, right? We have this power. If we have any power, the freedom of choice is the most important and the most powerful faculty that we have. And that's what we need in order for us to survive, for us to make sense of, of life, and to have some purpose, right? So what is free will? According to the dictionary.com, free and independent choice it's a voluntary decision. Decision. Remember, we're talking about trials and errors. So in order for us to make a decision, we're exercising sound judgment, right? We're always judging things. In order for us to make good judgment, we need to have experiences. We need to have some reference. We need to have a start point. What else? The doctrine that the conduct of human beings expresses personal choice and it's not simply determined by physical or divine forces. Mm, we got a little more complex here. So it is so powerful. The freedom of choice, the free will, that and it's a very good definition in the dictionary, that it doesn't it, it, it's not simply determined by the physical or even divine forces. Meaning like it's not, not even God imposes that on us. We have the freedom. So even if you don't have a belief in God, you are free. And this is the most important thing that makes us so special, that makes us different from the other animals, right? We don't have just an intellectual um, power um, comparing to other animals, but we also have this freedom. We're not just determining what we do. And how about trials? So when we're talking about trials, we bring in the uh, choices and our judgment and um, our free will to a level in which we have to put it to test. So trials, again, according to the dictionary, which are pretty good, um, we're using here because the dictionary brings very good um, definitions and, and is very applicable. A trial is a test of faith, patience, or stamina through subjection to suffering or temptation, broadly. It is a source of vexation or annoyance. Vexation is cause of trouble and affliction. Now it becomes complicated, right? Because now, you know, I have a choice, but in order for me to pass to some trials, I'm subject to suffering. Sometimes we don't understand what's going on with us. We're going through troubles, and we would like to live a life more peaceful without troubles, without problems, without having to worry, and, and, and that what basically is our concept of, you know, happiness. How can I live a good life? If I don't have any troubles, I have a good life. Wrong. Wrong. Problems, troubles, suffering, it's put before us because, number one, we attract them. They don't just appear for nothing. There is a direct relationship and responsibility over everything that happens to us. Nothing just happens just because it was God who, who wished that this happened. Or we are directly connected. We do not understand, because we do not understand, it doesn't mean that we are not connected to it. And the vexation part, which is a very complex word, to say that there is a cause for all the trouble and affliction. And why? That's a question for, for all, of, 
all of us. Why? Why? And I gave some, um, I gave some clues here. Present, future, past. Why do we have to go through trials? And the question is actually, do I have a choice? What do you think? We have a choice? Why do we go through trials? It's okay, guys. There is no wrong answer here. We're, it's a discussion. It's a conversation. We're not uh, subject matter experts here. We're just, we're just exploring this and trying to bring the spiritual message that comes from it. To learn from them. Very good. Evolution. Evolution. That's, that's very good. What else? Why why you think we have if if you're like in a show of hands so we kind of um, see how we stand with this. How many of you thinks that suffering is a necessity? Raise your hands. Okay. About about, not even half and a half, about 30 to 40 percent of you thinks suffering is a necessity. And so I am assume that the rest doesn't think this, uh, that, that suffering is a necessity. So let's explore the why here that we come up with. And this is not what, this is, um, you cannot change your past, but definitely you can change your future. So that is something that we do have a choice. We do have a choice because we are in constant movement. We're talking about evolution. In, or, in order for us to evolve, to make progress, to be better people, to be, make better judgments, we have to face challenges. Every type of challenges. And in that way, we can work today, and little by little, we can make things better tomorrow. So as part of the divine justice, and this is really, really the key word here, divine justice, and that's part of the, the law of cause and effect. So, cause and effect. If I did something, you know, you know that the term, if whatever, comes around, goes around. If you, if, you throw, if you throw something, something's gonna fall. So there is always a cause for a consequence. So a trial is a consequence. There is always a cause linked to that trial. We cannot speak about spiritual choices. Now let's, let's separate choices when it comes to spiritual choices. We have, we, have to, we have to go over this pyramid here uh, on the spiritual versus physical because in the world, everything that exists in this universe, in the multiverse, everything that there is, it's those three things only and nothing more. There is God in the top of the pyramid, there is the spirit, and there is matter. And all three of them exist together. The question is, do I really believe that God is part of this equation, this pyramid? It's a choice, right? We can choose just to live in a matter, not in the spirit or God, but no matter how we choose it, this is the more simple and the more truthful explanation that there is for everything. And I don't want to use my words. I'm going to, I'm going to put it to test because we have two personalities, and I'm going to play a very short video uh, for you. 
in, in, in where we talk about the existence of God. Because we cannot talk about spirit, not even matter, if we don't pass through the top of the pyramid. Do you agree that do you agree that this is everything that there is or not? You know, uh, raise your hands if you agree that there is more to it. I mean, agree with those three. So not, ev not all of you agree. Most of you agree that there, this is everything that there is. But some of you, or a lot of you, believe that there is more to it. So let's, let's listen to two astrophysicists. And they're not the most intellectual there is, but they're very known personalities. And that's uh, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mr. Michio Kaku. They're very, very, they have two different takes about this. Let's listen to it. And leads to the next question, because a few people on the lines are asking, do you believe in God? I, I've, I'm not convinced. If, if, here, here's the thing. If every, every time I talk about God with someone who's a believer, God is, is, is all-powerful and all-knowing and, and, and all-good, right? The, the good is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. And then I look at all the ways Earth wants to kill us. <laughs> Strike uh, you know, a tsunami takes out a quarter million people, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, floods. And, and I add all of that up. Either the God is not all powerful or is not all good. <laughs> but yeah. it can't really be both given all the ways the universe wants to kill us. And, 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 and if, if Earth is not uh, uh, finished killing you, there's the asteroid that could come in. Right. An asteroid rendered 70% of all life forms extinct. Back in uh, the, the famous one in 65 million years ago that took out the dinosaurs. So there's so many ways to die, not at the hands of someone else who has free will, mm -hmm. that I, I don't know what what is the nature of the God that you're talking about? I, I, I got to like try to like use your logic back at you. Uh -huh. But don't we define what, what is good and what is bad? So we see a tsunami wipe out a whole bunch of people, and we're, we're as human beings going, wow, that's bad, because we define what bad is. Maybe in God's brain, eyes, whatever the hell, that, that's not bad. Well, but except you defined what God is. Oh, boy. Wow. Now that's, you did it. That's so why, why do you have the power to define who and what God is, right. but not have the power to define what good is? And my point is we, we just don't know it all. Not even oh, close. Oh, oh, oh sure. So, so therefore, uh, if you're going to say God actually is good and a quarter million people dying from an earthquake and a tsunami and, and other natural disasters, right. um, and God presumably has control over that, and God is good, then we have to then say God works in mysterious ways, right? Yeah, so there that, you go. That's that. But people only say that when their understanding of God fails them. When right? it's a, something bad. No, no, when they can't <laughs> understand it, they say, well, God works in mysterious right, right, ways. Right, but yeah, somehow... In these other ways, you did understand him. Right. How are you saying, well, this is the, this is the handiwork of God. Is you doing God's work. God wants you to do this. Somehow you know God's motives every other way. Mm -hmm. when, but when a quarter million people get wiped out, God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. why, do you, why, why do you even claim to have access to God's mind in some contexts and not others? Oh, exactly. Just admit you have no clue right. and get on with life. That's how I look at it. We just don't have a, a clue when it comes down to it. Well, I'd like to think that preserving being... health and longevity, that is a nice operational definition of something that's good. Right. How, right. Can, you argue, why, how can you debate something that keeps you alive and healthy? That's got to be a, something that's good. I, mm -hmm. I, can't, I'm, I'm, I refuse to allow someone to say, I'm going to give you cancer, birth defects, and shorten your life and somehow call that good. I, I, I'm not going <laughs> yeah, there. I hear, you. I hear I, I'm, you. I'm not going there. Okay. So, before we go to the next viewpoint, and they are both astrophys uh, astrophysicists and their personalities. And the first, Mr. Um, Degrassi Tyson, 
he has a very pure materialistic view of God. And it's important for us to understand that. Many of us, or sometimes even in our own concept of God, we have that same view. It's very materialistic because it's how God presents himself under our perspective. So in his perspective, he's just concerned what is God as what's happening here and now. And that's all it matters to him, which is something for us to, um, to respect. However, this is one point of view. The point, the, what's missing in the materialistic viewpoint of the existence of God, and, and, and we all, we're, we're having this discussion here because there is no way for us to talk about spiritual choices if we don't, if we don't acknowledge uh, the spirit. If we're talking about the spirit, we have to talk about where we come from and everything that exists. So the next um, talk now, which is very uh, quick, this other astrophysiologist, uh, physicist, he introduces a materialistic point of view, which is also what Einstein brought, but with a philosophical explanation of God, which is uh, more complete. Yeah, well, it, it, I think it's a very a big, those big questions. Theoretical mm -hmm. physicists seem to come up against those throughout their entire careers. That's and why I became a theoretical physicist. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to bump up against those big questions. Constantly. And yeah. so, it, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's another question I was, I was really interested in is that I've heard that the majority of theoretical physicists are incredibly spiritual and have a great appreciation for the concept of consciousness and the soul and the universe and where it came from because these are the questions that they're constantly asking. Um, for yourself, how do you, um, how do you, what's your view on life and, you know, what, where is it? What are we doing when we teleport life if we ever get to that point? Uh, well, if I knew the answer to, to life, I would have it inside track up there. Right, right. As would anybody, yeah. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you how we, we, we physicists view things, mm -hmm. right? For example, um, Einstein was asked the big question, is there a God? Is there mm -hmm. a meaning to, to everything, right? Right. And here's how Einstein answered the question. He said, there really are two kinds of gods. We have to be very scientific. We have to de define what you mean by God. Mm -hmm. If God is the God of intervention, the personal God, the God of prayer, the God that parts the waters, then he had a hard time believing in that. Would God listen to all our prayers for a bicycle yeah. for Christmas and right. <laughs> smite the Philistines for me, please? Right. He didn't think so. However, he believed in the God of order, harmony, beauty, simplicity, and elegance, the God of Spinoza. That's the God that he believed in because he thought the universe was so gorgeous. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been chaotic. It could have been mm -hmm. ugly, messy. But here we have the fact that all the equations of physics can be placed on a simple sheet of paper. Right. Einstein's equation is only one inch long. Mm -hmm. And the quantum theory is about a yard long, but you can squeeze <laughs> it onto a, a sheet of paper. Right, with a small enough font. No. <laughs> right. And with string theory, you can even put those two equations together. And mm -hmm. string theory can be squeezed into an equation one inch long. Mm -hmm. And that equation, by the way, is my equation. <laughs> That's string field theory. That's nice. my contribution. Right. But we want to know, well, where did that equation come from? Mm -hmm. You know, This is what Einstein asked. Uh, did God have a choice? Was there any choice in building a universe? When he woke mm -hmm. up in the morning, he would say, I'm going to create a universe. I'm going to be God today. What kind of universe would I create? This is how he created much of his theories. But that scared them. Because they Okay, so this is what I wanted to present about this, um, these two very, very intellectual personalities. And they're talking about God out there. And we mention about, when we're talking about science, um, in the first case, Mr. DeGrasse was an atheist. Uh, Mr. Dikakos, he's a uh, Dikako, he's a agnostic. Einstein was agnostic, meaning that it's not that they don't believe in God; it's just that there it hasn't been proven. Therefore, they reserve the right not to 
not to, uh, to believe in God, but they don't disbelieve either. So that's agnostic. It's like you're in the middle, right? Um, but one of the things that it, the, the, the philosophy comes, right? So there is science, there is philosophy, and there is spirituality. There is religion. And, and, that is, and that is our job. That's the job of spiritism to make them come together. Because this is uh, the codifier of spiritism, Allan Kardec. He put it together, the, 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 the works of the, the spiritist doctrine in, in the five books of spiritism, in a way that science, because he was a scientific man, man himself, he was philosophical, and at the same time he, has, he had religion as a, a good foundation for him. And not himself, the answers of the spirits book that we talked about came from spirit. So, so he had to apply science in order to prove that. And he had to work, and the, the content of all the answers were philosophical, explaining reason. So what we learn, and again, I'm going to quote Mr. Stephen Hawking, uh, recently deceased, right? But his explanation for God is like the explanation for the universe. Okay, so there is no God who created the universe. His explanation was the law of physics created the universe. And, and so they don't need God, so the laws of physics. Who created the laws then? Exactly. And if you look unto, and in a way, look how an atheist responds for a very important question is aligned to the answers given by the spiritists. The spirits in the first question of the spirits book. What is God? God is the supreme intelligence, is the primary cause of all things. So, if we go back to what Mr. Hawking says, that the law of physics created the universe, what is really the law of physics? Law of physics is nothing but intelligence put together. It's a bunch of equations. Mathematics is actually based on philosophy. It is only a relationship and values that we give to numbers. And at the end of the day, the, great, the greatest mathematicians all come up, came up with their equations from possibilities. Mathematical is the same as philosophical. So there is no science without philosophy. There is no mathematics without it. But all of that is just intelligence. So if we change the words of Mr. Hawkins that intelligence created the world, that is God. And he is the primary cause of all things. In order, to, in order for us to understand the, the relationship of spiritual and physical, we use here nature, right? So one, another way for us to, and, and that is also in the Spirit's book, how can we understand God? How can we, how can we see God, right? Because it, no one's seen, seen God. So the answer is like, look in order for you to look at a, the cause, look at the effect, right? Cause and effect. So if you have a, a, a painting and the painting is beautiful, there's got to be something, somebody who painted, right? Who's the author? So there is an author for everything. If you look at nature, who created nature, right? What the, nothing came from nothing. There is no nothingness. So. When we, when, once we want to talk about this part here, the spirit and matter, if you use this illustration here, this is an avocado, right? So the outer part of the avocado, this, this part here, is the physical. The seed of the avocado, the avocado is the spirit. In the middle between the physical part of it, which is the heart part, and the seed, which is the spirit, we have an intermediary level there. 
which is like, in this case, the pulp of the avocado, right? That is the pure spirit. And the pure spirit is what makes the relationship between the spirit and the body. So the body is matter. Matter is the outside. And do you understand that concept? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So Mr. DeGrasse, for instance, all of his theory about God, he's looking at the perspective of the outside. He's not looking inside of the avocado. He's not conceiving that there is more to life than just what we see, just what somebody had has uh, written or some, something that I can prove it myself. The spirit, it's a good comparison with the seed because when we eat an avocado, we might even take it for granted that we're throwing away the, the seed, right? But that seed has intelligence in it. And that's what the spirit is. We're intelligence. We are power. This seed here does not mean that it's just a part of this avocado. These are thousands, millions of avocados. It seems it's imprinted in there. From that seed, a tree is going to come up, and many, many, many fruits are going to come. And those fruits are multiplied, and, and so on, so on. So there's got to be a cause for this avocado to exist. And, and, and if you look at nature also, if we look at the relationship between the matter, here represented by a caterpillar, like us right now, and the process of, of from the metamorph metamorphosis, metamorphosis? Yes. let's call it the transformation, right? So, so that process, it's very similar, it's very symbolic, okay? Uh, it's, it's a very similar process, how we, we change from one form into the other. And philosophically speaking, again, we are very similar to the caterpillar because the caterpillar lives in a very um, small area. He lives to eat, so he has to, the caterpillar has to eat a lot, concentrate a lot of mass, and that's all he does. And, um, and at one point of his life, he's going to become this, um, he's going to go inside of a cocoon, and from the cocoon, the butterfly is going to come. So the caterpillar dies and frees. The same caterpillar now is the butterfly. The butterfly, it's much lighter. The butterfly flies. It goes to many places. It, go, it flies to many countries. It has a different purpose. It spreads pollen of the flowers. It, 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 it brings eggs so the continuation of the butterfly population can continue, so on, so on. So there is purpose. And this is pretty much looking into nature, how we can see how God is perfect. The butterfly, the avocado, me and you, we just didn't come from chance, right? There's got to be a cause. A cause that's better than, than me and you. Something that is so intelligent that made us so perfect. It wasn't our parents who made us so cute as we are, right? They had parents, and they had parents, and they had parents. And, there's, and there is an existence out behind it. So that's where God comes to play. Did we pass this? This are we are we good between spiritual and physical? Because we cannot talk about choices without having explored that. I, I just wanted to get there so we can move forward. Do you have questions about this? Questions? Can we move forward? We're good. Let's about talk about the choices now. We know that we have physical uh, challenges, trials. We're talking about, Mr. DeGrasse was talking about how can God allow a person to have cancer? How can allow, you know, a mother to lose their child? How can God, you know, 
uh, have preferences over this type of people and the other type of people? How come there is so much unbalance, etc., etc.? And we do have a lot of physical trials. How about moral tests? Do we design our moral tests in the same way we do our physical ones? So we're already coming from the principle that we are responsible in designing our tests, our, our physical tests, because physical tests are consequences of a cause that we created ourselves. The answer is yes, even more so. Physical suffering is independent of one's action. Moral sufferings are self-inflicted. One the pride, disappointed ambition, anxiety is brought about by avarice, envy, jealousy, human desire. All these are torments of the soul. It's within us. So we have a character. We have an essence that is much more than what we are physically. We manifest. So we existed before. We're existing now. And we're going to continue existing. Um, we're not going to be able to cover um, all of the um, um, content about reincarnation. So I'm going to invite you to come next Thursday for a part two of this um, conversation, this reflection. We're going to talk specifically about reincarnation. We're going to actually have a little more informal format. And we're going to have questions and answers about reincarnation. So we're just going to pass by here, but feel free to ask questions about reincarnation because this is directly connected to reincarnation. And these questions, we, it's our repetitive here. You're always going to see in our lectures, my lecture or anybody's lecture, because this is an important question. Can we enjoy perfect happiness on earth? Show your hands again for yes or don't show your hands for no. Okay, we have one yes here, two, three. I'm going to count this time. We have four yeses. So your yes means we can enjoy perfect happiness here on earth. Right? Got that. So we have four. So the majority of you guys don't think we can reach perfect happiness here. And that is correct. <coughs> if I know that in some religion they say that um, earth is going to be regenerated and at one point of, of time we're going to have perfect happiness here. But we're talking about right now, how things are and all. So the answer is no. The incarnate life is designed for either trials or purification. So when we're talking about earth, we're talking about ourselves too. So that's probably the, the misconception sometimes that we think we can actually have perf when we're talking about happiness, we're talking about perfect happiness. Something so hard to be experienced that very, 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 very few people, if so, have experienced. We're talking about perfect happiness. In order for you to experience perfect, something perfect, you have to be able to understand and experience perfection. As ourselves, we have to have reached to a level that in order for us to experience something, we have to be prepared for that. We have to be deserving that. We have to be ready for it. So we can enjoy it. We can understand it. So that's why we go to the trials. That's why we go to the trial and error. So we can purification, not necessarily that we're going to become very pure in one existence. That's why we have to, the reincarnation, we, we come back again. We do it over. We do it better. And we come back again. Today I'm doing much better than I did yesterday. And so is in our lifetime. As a spirit, we're always evolving. It is entirely up to us and within our reach to lighten our lot on earth and live as happy as we can on earth. So for those who uh, lift our, your hand, this is pretty much what, what we can do here. There, it is possible to be happy on earth. It is not possible to have perfect happiness. But in order for us to, to, to have a relative happiness here, it is up to us. Besides purification, incarnation has a second and no less important function. It allows spirits to perform their share in the works of 
creation. So this is a very important and a very uh, special um, purpose of our life. And that is one of God's creation because we are part of God's creation. We are empowered of life. So we're, we're giving life and we have the, the power of life within us. Even if we don't have children right now, believe you, me, we can have, we can go through this whole entire existence without reproducing. It doesn't mean that we didn't have many, many children in another life and we're not going to have again and again. So that is in us. It is part of us. The experience of being a parent or even being a son or a daughter, it is the biggest testimony of God and how we are part of his creation. I'm just going to jump a few um, here. So, why and how we choose our earthly trials? And that is in question 258 and question 393 of uh, the Spirit's book. He chooses for himself the kind of trials which he or she will undergo. And it is in this freedom of choice that his free will consists. So once we, we're, we finish our earthly existence, we go back to our spiritual world. And in the spiritual world, we are going to live more fully our free will. And we're going to, give, we're going to be giving a choice we're going to re-examine everything that we did, everything who we are. Our most pure honesty is going to come to play, and we're going to plan. So that's why we are responsible for whatever is happening to us. We plan it. It was part of our planning. So that, was, that is the privilege is given to us. With each new existent, existence, a spirit becomes more intelligent not just intellectually, intelligent, intelligent in a, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, also intellectually, but we have to evolve in, in all capabilities that we are in order for us to evolve. And better able to distinguish between good and evil. That's why we're doing better every day. Even a, the most evil person that there is, that evil person one day will be good because it is just part of the evolution. You just can make mistakes so many times. Then one time, one way or the other, we're going to stop and do, and do differently. Where would it be his freedom if he, remember, if, if he remember all his past? That has to do with the present of us having forget, forgetfulness of the past existence. Imagine if we were to remember all the lives that we already have and all the choices that we already made, we wouldn't be able to live right now. We'd just be living in the past. We'd just be surrounded by thoughts. And to conclude here, again, this is just an invitation for us to get very, um, very close to our spiritual side. Next week, we're going to talk about reincarnation, and we're going to continue talking about this and exploring it some more. Just to conclude, um, how do I achieve, how do I achieve progress? How do I do this, right? How do I measure if I'm doing good or bad? How do I measure how am I doing? And that is in question 918 of the Spirit's book. The elevation of an incarnated spirit is proved by the conformity of all the acts of his or hers corporeal life with the law of God and by his comprehension of spiritual life. So, comprehension of spiritual life is, again, it's not just no intellectually. It's not like, you know, what I learned from the book. It's living that experience. It's looking at the mirror every day and seeing, who am I? What am I doing? What's going to happen after this is all ended? Um, morally, it is our biggest challenge, right? He is kind, benevolent, humane for all because he or she sees a brother 
or a sister in every man, or woman, wherever, whatever his race or his belief. So the more that we evolve, the lesson we are judgmental, the lesson we are materialistic, the lesson we are untrue to who we really are. I hope with this short time we had here, give some food for thought. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to come back again, we're going to continue this conversation next Thursday, okay? And we're going to talk about reincarnation. And hopefully you'll have a lot of questions for us. Thank you.